Carbon nanotubes are revolutionizing nanotechnology. This is a model of uh, a carbon nanotube, and it looks a bit like a fullerene structure. And indeed, actually, if you look at the structure, it's almost like half a buckyball on one end and half a buckyball on the other end, and with these extra atoms between. And it's about a nanometer across. That's a thousandth of a millionth of a meter. And that's why they're called nanotubes, of course. Most of them are slightly bigger, but we're on this nano scale, uh, which is why, of course, it's also very influential in affecting a thing called nanotechnology, which is all at this scale. Now, if you look at a nanotube, you've got the pentagons and hexagons that you need for the fullerenes, but they're basically on what you call the end caps, these beautiful curved caps. The rest of the tube is basically made up of hexagons, as you can see here. Now, um, the, uh, these structures are very, very strong and very, very long. There's no reason why you can't grow more and more, and more atoms along the waist to grow a thin fibre or tube, and that's exactly what we're discovering. These are immensely strong, lightweight structures which have interesting electrical properties. So how do you make a nanotube? Well, it, when you make fullerenes, you vaporise carbon in what's called a carbon arc. So you contact two pieces of carbon, put an electrical current through it and vaporise it. If you use a DC arc, instead of AC electricity, you use DC, you get a build-up on one of the electrodes on the cathode and you find nanotubes forming in the carbon arc. So you can actually make them in very similar uh, equipment that you use for making fullerenes. And basically what's happening is that a uh, graphite sheet is sort of wrapping up to form this tube. So let me talk you through that. There's actually three types of tube that can form. So if I take a graphite sheet here, so this is made of hexagons, as you can see. There are no pentagons, so it's flat. And you can see that the hexagons are aligned, if you like, in sheets or in lines. And you could, in principle, imagining taking this side, if you like, this sheet of the, uh, the graphite sheet and this, sheet of this, uh, this side of the graphite sheet and curve them round to form a tube. And that's one way that you can curve a graphite sheet. But actually, there's no reason why you couldn't take the other sides and curve it round this way. And uh, you get a different pattern. It's perhaps not obvious, but you can see that the, the hexagons are, are going along in a certain way. This is called uh, an armchair uh, nanotube, where the, the zigzag is forming a little sort of chair, an armchair. They call it armchair. I don't know why, really. And this, if you do it this way, this is called a zigzag nanotube, because obviously the carbon atoms are sort of zigzagging across. So you can, burn, you can bend the tube, the, the carbon sheet, to form a nanotube that way. Or in principle, theoretically, you could bend it this way to form a nanotube, and they have different properties. And also, interesting enough, if you take this side and bend it all the way around to there, you'll get a tube. But if you take this atom and instead of going to the other side, you go, say, halfway down, you'd think that would form a cone. But actually, what happens is it forms a straight nanotube with a spiral in it. So there's three, if we go back to the slide, there's three different types of nanotube that can be formed. What's called, depending on the way that you, you sort of curve the hexagons around or how they grow. You've got the armchair nanotube, the zigzag nanotube, and this one where the, the two sheets don't meet, they, they meet at a slight angle, and that produces what's called a spiral nanotube or a chiral nanotube. Let me show you one of those. This is um, a spiral nanotube, and I think you can see, if you look at that on the close-up, that the, the hexagons are not going all the way up straight and they're not going uh, at right angles, they're going at a certain angle, they're sort of spiralling round the nanotube. So that's an example of uh, what's called a chiral nanotube. And then here on the original metal I showed you, you can see that this is an example of a zigzag or armchair uh, nanotube where the hexagons are simply going up or around the nanotube. Now, it turns out that the electrical properties of these tubes is a function of the number of atoms around the waist, not really the length. So uh, you can have uh, metal-like nanotubes that conduct electricity like a metal. You can have insulating nanotubes, which are like a plastic and insulating. And you can have some that are semiconducting, like silicon. And so in principle, in principle, you could have a central nanotube, which is conducting, surrounded by another nanotube, slightly bigger, which is insulating. And you'd have a nano wire for wiring up on your nanocomputers in the future. And these are now being produced in quite large quantities, and they look like they're going to have amazing properties. The nanotubes are roughly 100 times stronger than steel, but a sixth of the weight. So if putting aside the, nano, the sort of electrical properties and supercomputers in the future and tiny little components, you can imagine a bicycle made out of this stuff or a tennis racket. 
that's six times, that's very, very light, six times lighter than steel, but a hundred times stronger. Imagine that. Imagine a pair of spectacles you could just throw on the ground and they wouldn't smash uh, with a diamond lens, perhaps. Uh, so in the future, we're not just going to have new technology, we're going to have new mechanical things, new bridges, perhaps new planes made out of these uh, nanotubes. There's all sorts of different types of tubes. We talked about the structure of the hexagons. Uh, they're roughly 100 times stronger than steel, six of the weight, and they can conduct electricity or be insulators, depending on the diameter. Um, the single wall nanotubes are almost perfect, but you can have multi wall nanotubes. So you can have a nanotube inside, a nanotube inside a nanotube. And then, in principle, you might be able to have a conducting one, as I said, surrounded by an insulator. Um, you can make nanotubes uh, not just with carbon, but you can have boron and nitrogen on them. And um, <clears throat> so you can have the single wall nanotubes, which are called SWNTs, the multi wall nanotubes, which is MWNTs, and you can have the boron nanotubes, boron carbon nitrogen nitrogen tubes. And you can have this whole array of different carbon structures with fascinating mechanical and electrical properties. This is a, a straight nanotube where one of the hexagons at the bottom here has been made into a pentagon, and one of the hexagons uh, over here has been made in a heptagon, a seven uh, numbered ring. And if you do that, it bends the tube. And it turns out that that affects electrical conductivity as well. So you can have this part of the tube, perhaps over here, is conducting. And the other part, uh, all over here, is maybe insulating. And you can make a little electronic component, which is conducting in one part, insulating in the middle, and conducting in the other part. And you can make perhaps a diode or a tuning capacitor all on the nanoscale. They're roughly a 1,000 times smaller in that direction, in that direction, in that direction than the current transistors. So they're, in principle, in the three dimensions, they're sort of like a million or a billion times smaller than current components. So they're going to be very, very interesting structures for, this, uh, for the future. If you want to know more information, please check out my website.